Thanks to Brilliant for sponsoring today's video. I think it's reasonable to say that mathematicians are obsessed with proofs of Fermat's little theorem. I think there are over a hundred distinct proofs of this result. And in fact, in modern times, it's a very important result as it fuels the cryptography that underlies the internet. So I thought I'd go over a proof that's new to me of this theorem. And it comes from Mathematics Magazine from 1999, and it's from Lionel Levine. And it involves the iteration of a certain function. But before we get to the proof, let's recall what Fermat's little theorem is and look at some examples. So Fermat's little theorem says for all integers a and primes p, we have a to the p is congruent to a mod p. So this might be a slightly different version than you're, than you're used to, but this is equivalent to the maybe more standard version. But let's notice that being congruent mod p is equivalent to p dividing a to the p minus a. Okay, so let's look at some basic, maybe calculational examples here. Okay, so for our first example, let's look at the case when a is equal to three and p is equal to five. So let's notice here we have three to the five can be decomposed as three to the four times three. Three to the fourth power is 81. So this is simply 81 times three. But notice 81 is one more than a multiple of five, meaning that 81 is congruent to one mod five. So when we reduce this mod five, we get one times three, which is clearly three mod five. But now if we look at this maybe from the extreme left to right hand side, well, we've shown that this indeed does satisfy for Mazdal theorem. Okay, so let's look at one more example. This will be the case when a is equal to four and p is equal to seven. So we have four to the seven, which we can decompose as four times four cubed squared. But notice four cubed is equal to 64. But 64 is one more than 63 and 63 is a multiple of seven. So that means 64 is congruent to one mod seven. So that means when we reduce mod seven, we get four times one squared or four mod seven. But now again, if we look at this from the extreme left to right hand side, we see that this also satisfies for Ma's little theorem. Of course, all of these will satisfy this theorem given that the theorem has been proved to be true. Okay, so before we get started, if you want to know more about number theory in general, including the number theory that would build for Mazel theorem, make sure to check out today's sponsor. If you're looking for a free and easy way to learn about number theory, check out brilliant.org. While watching my videos is a great place to start, you get more out of learning by doing, and that's why I highly recommend you sharpen your skills with Brilliant. Keep your love for learning alive with Brilliant's interactive lessons, perfect for those aged 10 to 110. You will be able to master whole topics gradually in as little as 15 minutes per day and learn anywhere, anytime on your phone, tablet, or computer. And Brilliant will support you every step of the way. Brilliant makes learning more like a game with fun features that let you challenge yourself and compete with others. No matter what skill level you're at, Brilliant can help you improve. Not sure where to start? They have introductory courses in a variety of STEM topics, from calculus, physics, computer science, and more, including a great number theory course that'll help you understand the topics in today's video. But we're scientists here, so don't take my word for it. You should test it for yourself. Treat yourself to a unique, hands-on experience by going to brilliant.org slash michaelpenn for a 30-day free trial and the first 200 people will get 20% off their annual subscription. Thanks once again to Brilliant for sponsoring today's video. Okay, so now we're ready for our proof of Fermat's little theorem based off of function iteration. Okay, so let's suppose that P is prime and that we have a number A which is bigger than or equal to two. So you might be a little bit worried about this because over here I say that a can be any integer. Well, notice if a is equal to zero, this is totally trivial. If a is equal to one, this is totally trivial as well. 
And furthermore, if A is negative, then we've got a negative number to an odd number. Well, P is most of the time odd. You could look at the case when P is equal to two on its own. And then you've got A over here. So that means like the minus signs are maintained. So anyway, all of that is to say that we really just only need to look at the cases when A is bigger than or equal to two. Okay, so we've got P is a prime, A is bigger than or equal to two, and we're gonna consider also a function. And this will be a function from complex numbers to complex numbers defined by f evaluated at z is equal to z to the a power. Okay, so that's good. But now we're gonna introduce a little bit of notation. So let's set f sub n to be the n-fold composition of f. So we'll just denote it like this. We've got all of these f's and we have n times of them. So we're composing f with itself n times. Okay, so let's notice that that implies that f sub n of z is in fact equal to z to the a to the n power. So I think that's like pretty easy to check by induction. Okay, great. And now we're gonna consider a set. And what will that set be? Well, I'll define it to be A, and it'll be all complex numbers that are fixed points under the function F sub n, but not fixed points under our original function F. So let's write it like this. We have F sub P of Z, and I should have said F sub n where n is equal to P. We've gotta get this prime in there somewhere. Okay, so we've got F sub P of Z equals Z. So Z is a fixed point, the P-fold composition of F, but it is not a fixed point of the original F. Okay, great. But now let's go ahead and rewrite that in terms of, well, really being roots of a certain polynomial, just given what these equations lead to. Okay, so this first equation will lead to z to the a to the p minus z equals zero. And the second one will lead to z to the a minus z is not equal to zero. But now let's count up the roots of these polynomial equations. Well, first of all, I'll point out that these all have distinct roots. In other words, there are no roots of order bigger than one. You can like check that pretty easily by noticing that the original function and its derivative do not share common roots. So that's not too tricky to do. Okay, so anyway, let's write this down. So here we have how many roots? We have a to the p total roots. Great. And then what about this second one? Well, I'm gonna look at the case when we're setting it equal to zero because that'll help us set up an equation. So this thing right here has a total roots. Great. So if we're looking for something that's a root of this first equation but not a root of this second equation, then counting all of these things up, we have a to the p minus a total numbers here. So let's maybe gather that over here. That'll actually be useful in the final step. So I'll just put note we have the size of a is equal to a to the p minus a. Again, because we're taking all of the roots here, but we're taking away the roots that are roots of that equation. Now we're gonna make our first of two claims. And this first one will follow like very, very quickly. And that says this. So for z and w inside of a, if, z is not equal to w, then f of z is not equal to f of w. So this will be useful for a portion of our upcoming argument. Okay, so let's see the proof of this little claim. Okay, so let's first of all suppose that f of z is equal to f of w, but notice that that means that f sub p minus one evaluated f sub z is equal to f sub p minus one of f of w. So that's just applying the f p minus one function to both sides. 
But notice that that's going to give us f sub p of z equals f sub p of w. But given that z and w are inside of a, that tells us immediately that z is equal to w because those are fixed points of the f sub p function. So there, we've proven that claim, well, technically using a proof by contrapositive. Okay, so now let's move on. Okay, so here's some of the stuff that we've developed so far. We've got these two functions, one which is an iterate of the other. We have the set built out of fixed points of one of the functions, but not the other. And then we've got this result that this function is, well, not necessarily one-to-one, -one, but one-to-one -one on the set A. And now we're gonna prove our second claim, which says for all Z in A, Z, F of Z, F 2 Z, all the way up to F P minus one Z are all distinct numbers. Okay, so let's do this and we'll do this by way of contradiction. So let's suppose, first of all, that F sub M of Z is equal to F sub N of Z, where I guess I should say Z is inside of A, but I think that's understood here. And here we have N is bigger than or equal to zero, which is strictly less than m, which is less than or equal to p minus one. So we might as well choose m to be bigger than n. Okay, great. So notice that this equation right here will tell us that z to the a to the m is equal to z to the a to the n. Great, but now just by dividing by z to the a to the n, we get z to the a to the m minus a to the n is equal to one. So again, that's dividing by this term right here. And you might be worried because what happens if z is equal to zero, but z is not equal to zero because zero is a fixed point of the original function, which excludes it from a. Okay, nice. But now what do we get from this? This tells us that z to the a to the m minus a to the n minus one equals zero. But let's notice that also we know that z to the a to the p minus one minus one is also equal to zero. And again, that's because f p z equals z but f of z is not equal to z. That means that we can factor a z out of the equation imposed by this fixed point. Notice that the degree of this polynomial right here is smaller than the degree of this polynomial right here, but since z is a root of both of these polynomials, what does that tell us? Well, that tells us that this exponent right here must divide this exponent right here. So let's write that down. So here we have, that means that a to the m minus a to the n must divide a to the p minus one. And then that's gonna split off into two cases. And our first case will be the case when n is equal to zero. So let's notice if n is equal to zero, that's gonna collapse to a sub m minus one divides a sub p minus one. But now that'll occur if and only if m divides p. So here we're using some facts about divisibility of polynomials versus some exponents here, but I think those are kind of like well known. Okay, so now we have m divides p, but since p is prime and m is less than or equal to p minus one, that means that m is equal to one. Okay, good. So now let's plug m equal to one and a equal to z. So let's plug m equal to one and n equal to zero into this equation right here and see what we get. So that'll tell us what? That z to the a minus one minus one is equal to zero, but multiplying both sides by z, we'll see that means that z to the a equals z after moving some things around but z to the a is f of z. So that means that f of z equals z. That means we're in this situation right here, which is a contradiction. Okay, good. So what does that mean? That means that n has to be bigger than or equal to one. That's the only other case. So like I said, n is bigger than or equal to one. Oh, but if n is bigger than or equal to one, this left-hand part of the divisibility is a multiple of a. 
So a divides the left part, that means a must divide the right part. So a divides a to the p minus one. Oh, but that means that a divides one. Oh, but that means that a equals plus minus one. Oh, but we assumed, well, at the beginning, it's gone now that a was bigger than or equal to two. So that led to a contradiction as well. So that means that, well, now we've got it. All of these numbers are distinct. Okay, so now we're ready for the final argument. Now we're ready to finish this argument off. So we'll use these two claims here. So this first one isn't written as a claim anymore, but recall that we did have that. So we're gonna start with this. Let's take any number that I will call Z1 inside of A. And what are we going to do with that? Well, we're gonna apply the function f over and over and over again, and notice that we get a loop. And that's because all of these are distinct. So let's see, we have z1, so applying f once, we'll have f evaluated at z1. Applying f again, we'll have f sub two evaluated at z1. We can apply f again over and over and over again, ending at f sub p minus one of z1. Good. But now if we apply f one more time, we will get back to z1 because we're assuming that z1 is a fixed point of f sub p. So notice that we've created a loop out of z1 and that loop has, well, it has exactly p elements and it has exactly p elements because of this second claim. And now we're gonna move on from this and we're going to take any, maybe I'll call it z2 inside of a outside of this loop. So I'll write it like this, so not in this loop. Good, and then because of this first claim, that's gonna complete a totally disjoint loop. Notice, like I said, it will not overlap with this loop because if it did overlap with this loop, then, well, we would have this claim right here not satisfied. Okay, so anyway, we've got another loop right here. Z2, applying F, we get F of Z2. Applying F again, we get F sub two of Z2 all the way around. But now we've got another loop and how many loops is this? The, and how many elements are in this loop? There are exactly p elements in this loop, kind of just by easy counting. Okay, so now let's finish this thing off. So we have the size of A is equal to p times the number of loops. Great, well, I think that's pretty clear because it eventually we'll exhaust all of A. But then on the other hand, earlier we counted that the size of a was equal to a to the p minus a. So reading from the extreme left to the extreme right, we have a to the p minus a is equal to p times something, but that's exactly the same thing as saying that p divides a to the p minus a, which is the same thing as saying that a to the p is congruent to a mod p, which was the statement in Fermat's little theorem. So maybe post in the comments, did you like this proof? Do you have a favorite proof for Fermat's little theorem? Maybe what is it? And that's a good place to stop. Thanks for watching and sticking around until the end of the video. And since you're here, don't forget to gently press that like button, subscribe, ring the bell, and select all notifications to never miss a video. If you wanna get your name in the credits like you see here, access the live seminar series, review videos before release, and more, go to patreon.com slash michaelpinmath and become a Patreon member today. If you want full ad-free course content, subscribe to my second channel, Math Major. I've got courses on linear algebra, complex analysis, and proof writing, among several others. And that's everything. Bye.